Good evening, Nats Chatters. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I am so excited to welcome Dr. Lynn Maxfield and Lynn Helding tonight to talk about cognition and the singing voice. And just as a very brief introduction to these two esteemed colleagues, Lynn Helding is a professor of practice and coordinator of vocology and voice pedagogy at USC. And she was the associate editor of the Mindful Voice column in Journal of Singing, which now Lynn Maxfield has taken over. Uh, she is currently writing a chapter in Scott McCoy's next a third edition of his book, Inside, uh, let's see, oh my gosh, Your Voice and Inside View. And it will be titled Brain and also has a forthcoming book called Mindful Musician. So lots on your plate, Lynn, and I can't wait to explore our topic with you tonight. And Lynn Maxfield is Associate Director of National Center for Voice and Speech, is an Associate Instructor at the University of Utah, and teaches uh, at the Voice Disorder Center at the University of Utah. And he wrote his dissertation in 2011 on the application of principles of motor learning theory to the studio voice lesson. So we have two incredible experts with us tonight to help us kind of unpack what is actually a rather complicated topic and how to make it applicable to singers. So thank you both for being here tonight. Thank you. Awesome. Wonderful to be here, Kari. Thank you. So let's dive in a little bit because we've got a lot to cover. And I'd like to start with just a broad overview of what is motor learning. And Lynn Helding, do you want to take it take it away? Oh, uh, well, motor learning is is the first thing we have to make sure we're clear about is that motor means muscle, right? So when we're talking about motor learning, we're talking about the way muscles process information, how they actually learn, um, and uh, the most important component of that is that we learn through doing, through actually practice and then repetition of that practice. So I, I think Lynn, uh, we have two Lynn's going tonight. I love that. So the two of us are in a room, it's always Lynn H and Lynn M, or as John Nix likes to call me, Lynn H. So. <laughs> Does that make me Lynn mm. <laughs> So Lynn mm, would you like to <laughs> Yeah, well, I think I think you've done a nice job of uh, of laying it out, and, and sort of there's a concise uh, definition that you can use that motor learning is a process that is inferred rather than directly observed, and we'll get to all of these elements of that uh, as we go along. Uh, it's a process in which the likelihood that you will be able to repeat a task uh, accurately and precisely. Um, as that, that that likelihood increases as a result of practice. Those are sort of the broad elements that uh, that encompass all of motor skill acquisition or motor learning. Mm -hmm. And I know we'll probably get into this a bit more uh, because I know we want to stay really on task because this topic can go down many rabbit holes. But um, there, there, a lot of our research comes from sports science and Although there are some similarities with music, there are also some significant differences. Do we want to chat about that yet or yield? I, I have one thing to say about that, and then I want to pass it over to Lynn M. Uh, I, I think it's really important to be able to keep everything you just said in mind, keep those two things balanced, which is that yes, you know, the vast majority of research on motor learning has happened in this field, in the field of athletics, but there's so much that we can take away from that as long as we bear that in mind and don't create any hard and fast rules, I think that, well, of course, this is then, that's what it means for musicians. I think we just have to wisely think about those principles and think what the commonalities are and then try to parse out the differences. The biggest one for me being that music is a complex cognitive task, not a simple cognitive task. And I think that's not a small difference. Um, but Lynn Maxfield wrote his dissertation on this. And last time I 
checked was one of the few people that had ever done any actual research into not ju not just music but singers and motor learning so i would pass that to him yeah and and uh it's one of those studies that um i think perhaps proved how foolhardy a, a young doctoral candidate can be <laughs> i think that oh, this, this would be a pretty easy application of um uh, of these broad motor learning theories that are actually, but when I was looking at them, had been fairly well established in uh, simple motor tasks, such as arm positioning for throwing a ball or kicking or something like that. Those are gross motor tasks um, that are fairly finite. And I thought that this would be a pretty simple uh, application. It turns out it was not, uh, and my data suffers from that, but uh, but absolutely, I did try to apply it, and I think you're absolutely right. Understanding the difference between uh, the complex and the and the simple motor tasks uh, is good, because most of the the hard and fast rules, or even as as hard and fast as the rules have become, uh, are applied as as they apply to the simple tasks, and we need to understand that our application of this to any fine motor learning. Uh, and complex motor learning is still um, relatively in its infancy. Yeah, okay. With that for a moment, um, I'd love to talk a bit about how you became interested in motor learning theory that then led to your dissertation. Sure. So um, after my undergraduate in voice performance, I took an extra year and did um, coursework to do a secondary music education uh, certification. Um, and then I went on to my master's degree and was thinking about being able to teach, uh, teach singing. And I realized that everything that I had been taught in the education component about teaching was much more about declarative learning and learning uh, about facts and how to teach those facts. And, and we hadn't done much at all in terms of how to teach motor skill acquisition. Uh, and so I started to draw a little bit on that. And then I had a course um, with uh, Eileen Finnegan at the University of Iowa called Voice Habilitation, uh, which actually we also teach here at the University of Utah, uh, but uh, that started to explore this idea of motor skill acquisition because they were, they were studying it in terms of training in voice therapy. Uh, and I realized, ding, that's a, a great little spot for me to start. And at, at that exact moment, um, within two months of me look, uh, glomming onto that, came Lynn Helding's first in a series of two uh, uh, articles in the Journal of Singing about motor learning. Oh, and I thought, here we go. And yeah, it, it sort of took off from there. How interesting. I love that full yeah. circle. Lynn, yes. H, how about you? Yeah, I, I think we shouldn't go too far uh, in this conversation without giving a huge shout out to uh, Kitty Bertolini, uh, okay. because that's how I got interested. Although mine predates way, way back when I was a student at Indiana University, and I got interested in what at the time was called kinesthetic learning or kinesthetic memory. And I, um, I was a very serious ballet student, but not not an expert, just a very committed uh, dance student. And I was always looking for some connection between um, what I was learning in dance and how that applied to learning singing. And I always found a lot of connections. So when I first found out about this thing called kinesthetic memory, I was really turned on. And, you know, this was in the days before the internet. And, you know, it was you really had to almost know what you were looking for in a library to even find anything. So fast forward, you know, several decades later when I was at the Somerville Ecology Institute um, to study there with Ingo Tietze and, and Kitty Bertolini and Kitty taught uh, a motor learning uh, unit. And it, it that was it, that was like the holy grail I had been looking for for decades. Um, and so to find this whole body of research, my class, my pedagogy class, and I have been uh, just on this unit last week and I wanted to make sure they understood that this is a field that's been around for over 100 years. This is not new. This is, you know, there's a robust uh, body of literature. And like many things in science, you know, it, there was a lull when we had to 
figure out whether we were going to kill each other or not in World War One and World War Two. We have these big, you know, but we also have a lot of uh, a lot of research that happened, especially during World War Two and the training of fighter pilots, that added to the knowledge base of how do you train people how to do something. So uh, Lynn M just used some important terms we should keep in mind tonight: declarative learning and procedural learning. There are many uh, lexicons in use for the psychology of learning, but these are the two most common. So declarative is facts. You know, we might say what you, what you go to school for, what you need to be taught in order to learn, whereas procedural learning um, in its basic form are things like walking that hopefully, if you are normally able to figure out yourself, uh, albeit with a few falls in between. So um, it's an important thing for us to keep in mind tonight, I think, during our talk, that this is a robust field in psychology that is over 100 years old. Very interesting. Um, let's talk for a moment about focus on motivation and its important to motor skill acquisition. Well, yeah, um, you can look at motor learning uh, through a lens of, of several different elements that influence your ability to learn. Um, and one of those elements is, is your level of motivation as the learner. Uh, and so then we as the teachers need to understand um, how it is that we can influence the motivation of our, of our singers. And um, the motivation has sort of taken a back seat to some of these other elements like feedback uh, where because feedback seems something is something easy that we can uh, we can change as the teacher, but us changing our learners' motivation, it's much easier to think, well, they're either going to be motivated or they're not, uh, and that's a little too simple. I think we can uh, influence um, uh, the motivation of our of our of our learners, and to understand that without that motivation, then they will not that some intrinsic motivation they will not be able to learn they will um they will just stagnate in the process because that that motivation affects their attention um which is absolutely essential to to the process of learning so we can think about um our feedback that we do give can be motivating or demotivating um, and there's some new research, um, relatively new within the last few years, that indicates that if we are focusing our feedback on um, on the positive attempts of uh, of the singers rather than the the negative attempts, uh, then that actually improves their retention and lowers their state anxiety, which then allows them to be in a in a state that they can uh, learn. So this is uh, somewhat backwards from what we often do. Oftentimes we listen to them find those faults, right? Uh, we're diagnosing and correcting vocal faults. And thank you, James McKinney. Uh, and and we're finding those faults and then we're focusing on all of our feedback on correcting that fault. If we can find ways to focus the feedback uh, and draw their attention back to what has gone right in that attempt or in that trial, um, then there's at least some evidence in, in the research that would indicate that they are, that they'll be better off and better served in their learning. Um, then the other thing that we can do, um, another interesting uh, element, and, and these are both in, in my next um, uh, Michael Action. column, uh, so okay. you can read, read on this a little bit later, but um, the, the other thing that, that can affect and influence a po positively their motor learning is to compare them positively to their peers. That doesn't mean you have to lie to them and tell them, oh, you're the best one of the group. You're always so great. But if we can find these areas where they are somewhat excelling, um, drawing their attention to those elements can actually be uh, beneficial to their self-efficacy and their uh, sense of autonomy, uh, which then drives them to be more motivated, more engaged, more attentive to the learning process. Um, as long as we are still being honest and um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, keeping our integrity uh, as, as the teachers, then if we can find ways to do that, then they will actually benefit from that. You know what, so one of the interesting uh, 
things that you just mentioned is for those of us of a certain age, the traditions we carry on, hopefully improve upon, but carry on the traditions of this teaching field of a few hundred years, right? And, um, you know, definitely when you get done singing, you turn to look to your teacher to tell you what you did, hopefully something right, but predominantly they're paying us to tell them how to improve. So there's a little bit of a paradigm shift, uh, Lynn, that you just, if we follow what you just said, there's a bit of a paradigm shift. Do you want to augment yes. that? You're absolutely right. And when we get to the, uh, we're going to talk about feedback in a little bit more um, uh, detail in a little bit, uh, I think. But um, when I, before I did my, my study for my dissertation way back when, I started off by observing a lot of lessons uh, and going to different studios. And what I realized was as soon as the singer would stop singing, the teacher would start st talking. <laughs> um, and usually it was to draw out their their faults and to try to figure out how to fix them. It's not an unusual or uh, unrealistic request. It's exactly what the teacher student relationship is built on. I'm giving you money to fix me, uh, or you know to improve me, or whatever you want to, however you, whatever language you want to use that's more positive than fix. Um, <laughs> but I. Uh, but it may not be the most efficient or effective use of our time if our uh, desire is to affect learning. Right. Now, if our desire is to affect performance in a one-time coaching or a two-time coaching, then that may be a different um, different path that you want to take down. You're right. It is going to be a, a paradigm shift. Uh, in your own mind. And it certainly has been in my own studio. And I actually, when I have new students, I have to talk to them about what I do differently uh, because I have had students be really frustrated with the fact that I just say, okay, try that again. Um, and there's a reason for that, but they don't like that sometimes. <laughs> I know we're going to come back to the long-term skill acquisition, knowledge of performance. Uh, Lynn, I bet, uh, Lynn H, I bet you have something to add to this yeah well i would add a couple things uh first of all um i mean uh, the it's i would just shade what lynn uh maxfield said um just add a little to that uh first part which is that even people who are t who tend towards what we might call sort of tough love teaching you know and i've heard this before that well someone has to tell them the truth you know um even if that is your deep belief, it just turns out it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Um, and so how do we as teachers say sometimes difficult things that quote unquote need to be said? So the first thing I think is um, some really interesting research about, again, motor learning. We're talking about uh, how muscles learn and muscles learn by sensation. So what I say in my studio all the time is muscles don't do words. Muscles do feeling, they do sensation. And there's a lot of evidence that when a teacher rushes right in there and tries to verbalize what just happened, we're actually preventing our students, our learners, let's say, from processing their own sensory information. So that's pretty interesting. Um, tagging right on to what Lynn Maxfield said, where you just say, hmm, Let's do that again. Or how did that feel, you might say. Sometimes I'll just say to my singers, okay, self-diagnose. You know, don't look at me to tell you what just happened. You tell, Why don't you put that out in the room for us to explore? Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing to keep in mind. And it is the old paradigm really is, I sing, master teacher tells me what just happened. Whereas a motor learning lesson might be, I sing, and then I need to process that sensory information and the teacher and the student figure that out together. And that's where attention becomes so essential to the process because yeah. they have to be being attentive during the trial and in the moments after it uh, to what is happening in order for them to self-diagnose and come up with the next uh, the next step and the next hypotheses that, that, that they'll test. Right. 
really a buy-in that we need from our students. They have to buy in. It, as you're talking, I keep thinking of the word compliant because in the work, or work with the medical team, right? We talk a lot about compliancy. How do we make the patients compliant? And there, you, there's a lot of that in this. Uh, Lynn H., you, uh, a couple notes you have for me about, um, I just lost it. Oh, autonomy and joy of learning. Ultimately, <laughs> We are trying to lead them towards that so that they buy it. Yeah, let me just say one quick thing about compliance. Um, actually, the new word now is adherence, which is interesting because compliance, again, sort of has this master-student relationship. You know, you yeah. will comply with the orders I give you versus can you adhere to the recommendations that I offer you? Which, you know, that sounds like wordsmithing, but I don't think it is. But one of the things that Kitty uh, turned us on to years ago in this course was a famous uh, study that was done um, in the World Health Organization. You can still find it, the WHO report, that showed after everything else being equal, why, and this goes back to your question about motivation, why do people um, comply? Or now we would say, why do they adhere to their physician's directions? And the number one reason was physician warmth, which translates to, does the physician care about my health? Do they care that I'm going to get better? Um, not how well educated they are, not the treatment itself, certainly not tough learning or tough love. Or, you know, if you don't do this, you're not going to get better. Um, so it's an interesting way of looking at uh, some of the medical, the social psychology in research in the medical field to see, again, how might we borrow a little bit of that. And mm -hmm. it, it really comes down to, you know, do, do you feel that your teacher cares about your improvement? It doesn't mean I would add the flip side is not true. You know, it's not like we should show up at all of our students, you know, uh, auditions and warm them up and hold their hand and tell them how wonderful they are. I mean, you have to find some some core, I think, of strength on your own, which is part of what this learning does is it inculcates, I think, as Lynn M. said, autonomy and responsibility on the part of the learner, which actually makes you stronger as a learner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually that's a, it's a self, uh, uh, quickly, uh, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once they find those little bits of success, um, mm -hmm. then the success begets more success. Not simply because they are, um, they are, you know, the cream is always right at the top, that if you're getting better, then you're always going to get better, but that the experience of having that bit of success can actually cause more success. It causes yeah. you to be uh, a better learner and therefore a better performer le later down the road. Yeah. Do we want to dig in a little deeper now about difference between knowledge of learning and knowledge of performance? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on. Dave, I love this one. Well, we, uh, in my pedagogy class last week and the week before, um, you know, it's a big one, and I, I put it up there on the screen, you know, that the difference between performance and learning, and when you read about it in the textbook, it can just go right past you, not because it's complicated, because it's just so boring, it's just like this boring description, and I really try to help all of my students understand how very profound those differences are. So the way that I explain it would be that um, learning is a process, and some say it is the number one uh, uh, thing, activity of life. It's what we do from the moment we're born till the moment we pass away. We're learning always something. And uh, therefore, it is dynamic, which means it moves. It's constantly moving. It's very hard to pin down the moment of learning because you're either just entering it or you're just at the end of it. And the evidence that something is learned is that it's repeatability. And at that point, you're no longer learning. It's done. It's past tense. So learning is very dynamic. It's transitive. I also say it's very messy. It's a very messy process. Um, it, it can be joyfully messy. It can also be um, horribly messy. It can be um, humiliating. It can be frustrating. So sometimes your worst lesson is your best lesson because you're actually learning the most when you feel the most shaken up. You know, 
put that away and look at performance. Performance is a snapshot of where you are in time. That's all it ever is. And yes, we want to we want to clean up for that, right? We don't want to go and learn in front of an audience. That we don't want to be messy in front of an audience. We want to have a performance as polished and professional as we can maintain at that moment. I think people get into trouble when they use those terms synonymously or when they mix them up in their mind. And we have to say at this point, it, that goes both ways, not just the student. The teachers, I think, too, can sometimes confuse these. So um, I'm always trying to help my students have, you know, permission to be sloppy and messy. You know, I'll sometimes say, well, it's fine. You know, there's it's just you and me in the room, right? Who's going to know? It's let's just let's do this five more times. And, you know, if it goes flat, who cares? It's not the end of the world. Um, yeah. Right. And it's so I think these uh, these terms are really important to keep straight. Um, teachers, my biggest piece of advice to all of us is know when to stop teaching. Um, I would say a classic moment is, you know, the week before someone's big debut or their senior recital, you know, no, stop. <laughs> Don't be trying to load new information in there. You want to sort of help someone get to that performance moment, which is that freeze frame in time. I heard you say that in your uh, in the Nats uh, conference last June, and so my students have heard me say that all year. It's a week before your recital. I have to shut up. Lynn Heldy tells them I have to shut up. <laughs> but, and it, but it's so I mean, I don't know. It was just validating to hear you say that. That is, it's I'm not. I'm going to use a double negative. I'm not not doing my job because. Because I, I feel like I'm withholding. I'm not giving. I'm not giving and, them the money's worth, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, a there's an important shift that, as a teacher, I can take away from what you guys are bringing to the table now. I think that's important. Lynn, Lynn I'm sure you want to jump in as well in this topic. Well, I think um, I, I think you're you're leading to this really well, Lynn Helding. But but you an important element of, of, of the differentiation between performance and learning is that sometimes what you see as a boost in short-term performance ability is actually degrading your long-term learning process. Um, and that includes, uh, if I give you a lot of feedback and I'm spoon feeding you to the, the performance, that's going to degrade your learning actually, even though, by the end of the lesson, by heck, you're going to sound better. Uh, but by the start of the next lesson, you won't have retained as much uh, of that. Do you want to in, uh, give more on that, Lynn Helding? Yeah, um, the Robert Bjork um, studied this and gave it a, a beautiful name. He calls it desirable difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, and he discovered that, I think this is quote close to the quote, uh, solutions that learners discover for themselves, and I would add who, that's uh, solutions for which learners have to struggle a little bit, are more retained. They're more learned than things that we just hand over. Um, so, you know, and again, when I give these talks, I always want to make sure we're saying we're not ever talking about being mean or humiliating or, you know, ripping someone's heart out. That's not what we're talking about ever. You know, it's just these, I would call them benevolently constructed desirable difficulties. We create a little obstacle course for our learner and help them navigate their way through. But helping doesn't mean always spoon feeding. Um, we hope that they can struggle just a little bit and reach just a little bit higher, further, harder, more effort and learn. If they have to reach too far and they fall on their face, then you've given them something too difficult. But if they just grab it and it's like, yawn, I'm here already, they're not going to really struggle to, it's already something they know how to do, which goes back to that wonderful practice maxim, you know, practice what is difficult, not what is easy. Because if you're practicing what's easy, you're performing. That's really not practice. Practice well, doesn't always sound great, <laughs> at least not when I do it. And Lynn Helding, that, for, forgive me if I'm you know going too far back in in cognitive uh, theory here to something that's outdated. But 
um, when I was in my education classes, we talked a lot about Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. Yeah. You want to keep your students in the the level that they it's they can't do it on their own, but they can do it with a little bit of guidance and with a little bit of feedback, and that's where they learn the best. That's where they acquire that that knowledge the best. Um, I haven't heard much about Vygotsky in the last. 20 years, so maybe I'm I am uh, outdated. Oh, he's still out there, yeah, he's still out <laughs> there, and that's I mean that's a really that's a robust idea, you know. And sometimes just in, or a quick way of talking about it, we just say it's the Goldilocks rule, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, if something's too hard, you're gonna fall on your face. If it's too easy, yawn. So where's that sweet spot in the middle? But then that in itself is not always an easy place to find. I call that the art of teaching is, you know, how many times you can really strike that middle place where people have to dig just a little bit, just a little further, not too much, but not too little. That's and it. That's it. Sorry. And that's that circles back to what I was talking about earlier about um, being able to impact the self-efficacy of the learner by providing them opportunities to have success. Um, it's not that, uh, that, it's sort of contradictory or seems counterintuitive to the idea that uh, positive performance shifts, shifts in, in better performance in the short term don't always mean long, better learning, but them experiencing some of those positive performance shifts can influence their self-efficacy and their motivation and therefore their attentiveness to the process. Uh, so in a back door, it can feed back into a, a better learning experience. Yeah, and better learning overall, too. That's very robust. Uh, we should mention that, Kari, very robust in motor learning research that um, short-term decrements in performance actually have a long-term benefit in learning. Yeah. And then the reverse is true. So you can crop up learning and make it look really good in the short term, but in the long term, you find the person didn't really learn anything. That's actually what I've dubbed master class syndrome. That I love is that. I love that. what happens in master class. And you know, be, be, I have to say something about this because uh, over the years since I invented that little term, there's always someone that is very skeptical and says, "Are you saying that a master class experience is not worthwhile?" No, <laughs> I'm not saying that. Or are you saying that people who teach master classes are just hoodwinking the people that participate? No, of course not. Uh, but if we just look at the cognitive substrates of learning and that one of the most robust pieces of evidence that we have that something is actually learned is its repeatability. So what I'm what I call master class syndrome because it happened to me as a young singer, and I've seen it happen so many, many times, where the singer does this amazing thing in front of an audience, and they're crying, and they're like, I've never been able to hit that high note that way. It was fantastic. And then 48 hours later, it's gone, right? It's just vanished, and they can't get it back. So it's, it's so then the question becomes, well, was it a worthwhile experience? Well, of course it was, because first of all, you know it's possible. There's some evidence that if you, and I just say this, run, don't walk to the practice room immediately after that master class. Yeah. And I mean, run, you might be able to call that up again for yourself. It That seems to be completely related to how expert you are as a learner. So maybe a very, very beginner might not be able to do that without with, without guidance. But you know, someone who's a pretty advanced singer who's shown something new in a master class for whom it really worked and really opened something up, it was pretty good evidence that they could figure that out on their own, but not if they let 24 hours elapse. Yeah, and if they run back to that and experience it again, then they're entering this idea of, of student-directed learning, which you talked about earlier. They are then forming these hypotheses and testing them quickly uh, and, um, and we know that student-directed learning is usually the most efficient. And the, the most effective, right, Lynn? Yes. There's that research I know you're interested in about st about student autonomy or learner's autonomy. That was the question you asked earlier too, Kari. I love this, that uh, it's actually one of the most important motivators of humans is not um, rewards, it's not finances, it's not treats. You know, it's actually the love of learning and the love of success that 
gets us going. Um, and so if you can't, if people can just experience a little bit of success on their own, um, that, you know, there's a lot of evidence that, that they'll, they'll just learn faster because they're their own. We have a, a question, um, from Colin Johnson and he says, which is more effective knowledge of results or knowledge of performance in retention? Lynn M. <laughs> um, I typically tend to skew toward uh, knowledge of the performance because that usually is more uh, prescriptive. Uh, it, it gives them more of an idea of what they did and why they did it. Whereas knowledge of, okay, so knowledge of results is, um, is sort of the end. This is what happened. Uh, but their knowledge of their performance is how it happened and how it got to there. So knowledge of results is you were flat. Knowledge of performance is um, to fall back on an old, you know, uh, old teaching technique. You didn't support. Um, and so you give them some idea of what they can change to affect the the outcome at the end. Um, so that said, uh, knowledge of results can still be beneficial if uh, it's not something that, that, that that learner could have experienced on their own. So if the uh, knowledge of result is your flat, chances are that singer could have experienced and known that they were flat on their own. Therefore, it's less desirable. Um, if your knowledge of result is, I couldn't hear you over the piano in the third row, they couldn't know that. Uh, and so that knowledge of results can still be beneficial in the moment. But I think the knowledge of performance tends to be a, a clearer line toward uh, learning. Thank you. Hopefully that answered. Thanks, he says. <laughs> So I'm mindful of the um, the clock, and I do want to save time for, for questions, but we have now another big section of what are the most important components of motor learning? Um, <laughs> talking about uh, practice and feedback. Well, um, why don't we say that the, the by... Um, Two of the most important motor learning researchers are, I'm gonna hold up my book actually, Tim Lee and uh, Richard Schmidt. Okay, this is the, I think, fourth edition. It's now in its sixth edition, which just came out. Um, so I could get my third edition off the shelf if you needed it. But. So which one? <laughs> my, okay. I have just a third, I'm, I'm all yeah, old. I have three, four, and five, and I gotta get six coming here. The um, so according to them, practice is the most important component of motor learning, followed by feedback. So we've talked, uh, I guess, about um, both. Um, there's something called the laws of practice. Should we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um. So um. Uh, blocked versus mass. Let's see. Let's check these out. Um. What have we got? Your, your notes, space versus mass, variable versus not variable, random versus blocked. Okay, so let's start with the first one. Um, that's the easy one, I think, but it's an important one um, that has to do with timing. Um, so I always give this example that if you wanted to practice, let's just, I try to use easy math, um, uh, right, three hours a week, which probably isn't enough, but let's just take that. Um, and you practiced a half hour every day over six days for three hours versus three hours on Sunday because your lesson's on Monday. Um, there's all kinds of research showing s several things. So first of all, in terms of just cognition, um, space practice is far more beneficial because of the importance of sleep. Um, there's some fascinating research that's now been done on sleep having to do with uh, literally brain cleaning that happens during sleep. So we clean out detritus, we clean out stuff we don't need. And at the same time, we're actually sinking into our cognition, our memory, the stuff that we felt was important enough to hold on to, 
which mm -hmm. includes things that we practice. So that's over time, that's going to be a much more robust holding of information than just clotting it all up on one day and then having six days off. The second thing, which should never go without saying in motor learning, is that when we clot up practice on one or two days, it's like weekend warrior stuff. You're going to get hurt. Um, it's not a good way to practice muscular movement because of the propensity for injury when you overdo it on one day and then you take it easy on all the other days around it. Do you want to jump in, Lynn? No, I think I think you're covering it very well, but that's the first thing that I tell my young singers when they're trying to figure out what to do with their practice time. You know, we talk about what we how much we expect uh, their of their practice time in the off week between lessons. But how they break that up is actually really important. And I, I tell them just that. Don't give me two hours three times during the week, you know, two hours at a time. Break it up. Pop in there for 20 to 25 minutes at a time um, and, you know, do that several times during the day. And you'll actually retain those skills better uh, than if you were to give me a big block. Um, I'm not entirely sure of, of all of the the truthfulness of it, but but uh, way back when, when uh, Shirley Emmons and Alma Thomas wrote their uh, power performance for the singer or something like that, um, they gave some indication that you retain better what you begin a session with and what you end a session with. So uh, by that math, just starting and stopping practice sessions uh, is more beneficial than having one, uh, one big long one where you only get two two sections, one start and one stop uh, during the day. If you can break that up into three sections, then you get six sections uh, that you're going to remember better. Yeah, and I would add something to that, um, which is that something I ran into, just a little teeny tiny reference, and I was so taken with it, I actually wrote to Richard Schmidt and Tim Lee, and they emailed me back a bunch of times, and they, they gave me a lot of other resources on this idea of unlearning. Yeah. So it turns out that especially when we're trying to input, input something new or relatively new, um, that there's a little bit of unlearning that's going on at the same time. So that just fascinated me. You know, again, it made me realize that when people confine their learning to one or two days a week, um, they're always in a little bit of a state of unlearning and they never get on a roll to build build momentum toward the thing they want to learn, which I was really fascinated by. Um, and the other thing I would add, I want to add at this point too, is this is not just for young singers or beginning singers or singers in training. Um, I want to speak to our, um, our Nats, our seasoned Nats teachers. Um, I found this to be true when I was a, a young mother of two small children and I had a full-time job and I had a full studio and I was still singing and it was so challenging to find practice time and I finally realized that 20 minutes a day was golden rather than trying to always clear enough time so I had my hour and a half that I had been used to when I was a student. So that, it, I, I just, I, I would never actually practice any differently now. It, it made all the difference in the world, especially when I was trying to learn difficult contemporary music, um, really, really hard music to learn, hard music to memorize. If I just got 20 minutes in a day and waited till the days when I had more time, I, my practice was so much more efficient and I got so much more done. So based on some of the studies that you've read, and since we have a lot of members who teach the under 18 year old and whose parents are paying for these lessons and they come to one of the, the fifth lesson in and they say, how much should my child be practicing? Yeah. What answer would you give to that question? Which may be a little detour from actual motor learning theory, but it's, yeah, what would you say to that parent? Um, I would say half an hour a day, five times a week would be just optimal for a team. Okay. And if you can't get that in, don't, you know, don't uh, get too upset about it. But that's the, I would say that would be the goal to work towards. 
for a 16 year old. Okay. Oh gosh, all of a sudden we're getting a bit. Let, let's take, I know we need to get to the, the feedback part too, but there's some questions here. So let's just take a moment. Is this an okay time? Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I love this question from Amy Kepler. Could either of you share any specific examples of influencing motivation in a student? Have you seen this in action in regards to a student's turnaround? If so, what do you think made the difference? <laughs> I have one thing to say, and then I'm going to segue over to you, Lynn. Um, well, let me let me say that um, I have not. Uh, so I just came onto this this motivational stuff um, really in the last couple of months as I was writing that my uh, the, the last edition, the issue five of the uh, Mindful Voice this year, um, and. And the reason I got excited about it was because uh, it, it is an element. It's, so we have these three components of, of motor learning that are so important, practice, feedback, and then motivation is the one that we never talk about. Uh, and so I wanted to talk about it a little bit and dig into it. And so no, I, I can't give a firsthand experience of when I've used these these elements, but I certainly will be moving forward. And, and I'll, uh, I'll get back to you in a year and see if I can improve, improve some motivation. I mean, well, part of it is you know, going to bring what motivation they have, but if I can influence even one or two of my singers to be slightly more motivated than they are, then it'll be great. But it's a bit of a test case right now. Well, I would also say let's remember that motivation is the holy grail. You know, whoever figures out the magic motivator for all of us to pick a diet and stay on it, or pick an exercise regimen and stay on it, you know you're going to own the universe. Um, it's a really tough question. So I, I, I actually uh, have found every time I try to tackle this issue, I end up with that thought always in my mind. But I did find one very robust finding that is in my chapter and be my book. And it's goal setting. And as kind of oh ho-hum as that sounds, um, I think it's a really important exercise to ask your students to go through and uh, obviously scale it to the uh, to their age and maturity and ability level. But there's some really strong uh, literature about goal setting, and I'll just pass on a few tips. Um, number one, it needs if if you're teaching, uh, especially high school students, it needs to be their goals and not their parents' goals for them. Um, they need to be clearly articulated, and they also need to be not vague. So something like, I want to be a comma better singer, way too vague. You need to be very, 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 very detailed, as, as, as molecular as you can. So something like, my goal is for the next two months, I'm going to practice no matter what, I'm going to put in four times a week for 30 minutes a day. So it has to be realizable. Um, and and something that is slightly short term and not vague and something that they articulate for themselves. And then you revisit the goals. So I actually put that into practice in my studio quite a while ago. I ask all my students to, to just first semester, first week, they need to write down their goals. And again, very specific ones. And then I ask them, and how will you realize them? So not just what the goal is, but what are you going to do that might take you in that direction? And that does seem to spark motivation, intrinsic motivation inside. Love that. That's directly related to self-efficacy because they are they are realizing success, and that's why developing those those goals to be realizable. There has to be something that you can clearly say, "I did it" or "I didn't do it." Yeah. Um, and that's that's a hard thing for young singers to do. It's hard for me to to do to put it into very discrete little elements. But yes, being able to realize success is going to then drive that self-efficacy, which will then promote motivation. Yep. Exactly. There's always that di dynamic dance, isn't it? Part of the motivation can come from the teacher, but there also has to be that self-efficacy and that you know drive and all of that that have to live together. And each individual singer requires something a little different from us as teachers. So navigating that can be a real challenge sometimes or joy. <laughs> <No>. <laughs>
Um, let's go. Gosh, we are going to get so against our time. Um, That's all right. You got some other questions there? We have several. Do we want to we talk yeah, about them? I'll, I'll just say you can, look at, you can look at the feedback discussion a little bit more in my 2013 paper, uh, Internal of Singing, uh, where I've sort of summarized feedback a little bit more cleanly. And uh, you can always read that on your own. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's see how many of these we can get through. Um, regarding master class syndrome, we are saying that motor learning is very hard in this type of situation and hard to find the repeatability in whatever task was asked of us at that time. But what about declarative learning? I can take a fact, even an audience, as an audience member, and run to the practice room and try it out for myself. I guess my bigger question is, can you have motor learning without declarative learning? Oh, that's a big, that's a huge thing in academic philosophy right now. And the simple answer is apparently no. <laughs> you, have to, you have to know, the, the code is you have to know that in order to know how, um, particularly if it's a complex task. So that's why I always say when people say, are you saying it's not a worthwhile experience? I'm saying, no, of course it's worthwhile. Um, exposure is not learning. That's a, that is a fundamental rule of procedural learning and modal learning. Just being exposed to the idea is not by the cognitive rules of what learning is or its evidence, which is that you can do it yourself, is learning. That doesn't mean it doesn't have worth, right? And that doesn't mean that being exposed to an idea isn't something that you could work with, absolutely. Um, but we just have to, I would say one other thing, the premise of that question, it depends on your ability. If you're already a very fine singer, you may be able to work in a master class setting and um, truly learn something if the next day you could do it again and again and again. And another hallmark of motor learning is can you do it, uh, so it's two things, in repeated trials and under variable conditions. Right. Right, so with an audience, without an audience, in a different acoustic space or not. Standing on your head, if that's what your director wants you to do in a crazy staging. I mean, the more you can sort of move that skill around and it, it holds up, it's robust, it's shown to be learned. Thank you. Uh, Lynn H., would you expand a little more on the unlearning concept? And that's asked by Robin Frey Monell. Hi, Robin. Oh, it's such a cool idea. Um, I, it, I have, um, I don't have very much time to say this. It, it just seems that when we're trying to input a new motor task, um, in particular, if you're trying to get rid of a bad habit um, and put in a new habit that is your preferred habit, uh, it's you have to push the unlearning button and there's a period of time where um, you're not good at the new skill but the old skill starts to degrade so I call that reaching around for your blankie and it's no longer there so you may find that when you're in the midst of this unlearning thing in the back of your mind think well if it doesn't work out I'll always go back and do it the way do it the way I used to that wasn't great but it worked okay and you reach back and, whoa, it's not there anymore. Um, you know, it's like an, a pair of jeans that fit before you went on vacation and they don't fit anymore when you go home. Uh, so there's a, it's a fascinating idea. Um, it's, there's some research on it. I talk about it in both of the writings I think uh, Carrie mentioned. Um, Zanone is the researcher, just like it sounds, with a Z, uh, who's done the most work on this unlearning idea. But um, it, it's, I think it's pretty interesting. I think it's also what probably happened to Tiger Woods when he tried to learn a new cutting technique. Um, we have to degrade in order to make room for the new thing, or I explain it sometimes like you have to rough up the surface of the wood you're going to paint before you put the new paint on or it just won't stick. Um, and it's kind of a moment in learning that's very uncomfortable for people because it, it can make you feel like you're suddenly you can't do anything at all. Very klutzy, you know. Um, but if you hang in there and you practice and you have good feedback from a coach, you can probably find your way through to the other side. And Bozeman says it's called an implementation dip. 
I like that language. Thank you, Ken. Um, uh, and he says, uh, can't still do the old thing and can't quite do the new thing yet. Implementation dip it in our dance lessons. <laughs> dance lessons. I love that. Motor learning, they just call it a negative performance shift. Negative performance shift. <laughs> um, Leslie Crafton says, "You could you name them? Could you mention the name of the motor learning book again?" Sorry. Oh, I'm gonna just hold it up. So, uh, this is the most. This is the fifth edition. Um, does that look like backwards? Motor learning and performance by Schmidt and Lee. But I would get the sixth edition, which is the newest, most updated one. This one's actually pretty thin. Uh, Richard Schmidt just passed away. So uh, this one is not as robust as the sixth one, which just came out and has uh, now as one of the authors, Gabrielle Wolf, who's done a lot of the research on uh, focus of attention, locus of attention. Um, Katya Reamer, I'm sorry if I miss name. Um, I, she says, I have a student who often makes the same errors even after several corrections. It seems once he gets a word in his head pronounced incorrectly, it's very hard for him to change. What do you suggest for this issue? Well, Em, you want to take that one? I have an idea, but... <laughs> no, I'll, I'll let you go with it because I'm still processing the question a bit. Well, I would say the first thing is to, uh, if it's a, if it's a, uh, an issue of pronunciation, you think about articulation as movement and not as sound. Really important that sometimes you have to actually tell people, touch your tongue here, or say it the way you've been saying it. Where do you feel your your articulation? Where do you feel your tongue? Where do you feel your soft palate? Where do you feel those things happening? And then try to um, as um, Oh, who's our friend? I'm going to think of it in a moment. Um, I've got the book right here. Kurt Alexander Zeller says that articulation errors have to be moved away, right? So we have to think of um, an error in sound as a movement error and not a sound error. You know, that would, that would be such a beautiful segue into a uh, locus of attention. <laughs> <laughs> that is the perfect segue as we're at the end of our time. But Lynn, I do you that's such a huge um rabbit hole. Anything you want to share? Lynn M, right? It, it, either of you. Well, the locus of attention is uh is absolutely a big, big uh rabbit hole. And basically the question is do you focus your attention in or out? And the answer is it's still a bit uh, debatable, uh, but uh, not according to Gabriele Wolf. Uh, but um, but there is some evidence that uh, that there's a shift that needs to occur depending on the ability of the learner. That the your locus of attention can shift uh, as you get more experienced and more successful. Uh, that then maybe some of the more uh, external attention can be more beneficial. And I would say that I'm, uh, I've written about both sides yeah. of it and tried to present that. both sides so that people can make up their own mind. Yeah. I was just going to plug that when, when the, when McCoy's third edition comes out and your chapter is in that you do so beautifully, I had the privilege of reading that and you so beautifully lay that out. Um, and, you know, there's going to be strong opinions, I think, on both sides. And I think with all of the motor learning conversation, it depends on the student in front of you, right? I mean, we vary these principles if we have a beginner or we have an advanced. Everything you've said tonight, I thought, well, I would apply that differently depending on my student. Yep. So That's exactly what I found uh, in, my, in my dissertation, going back to that, was there was a bifurcation of what was needed uh, by the naive learner to the expert learner Absolutely. Uh, or the more advanced learner. I never really worked with an expert learner, but um, yeah. but it's not a, a completely one size fits all set of rules. As Lynn Helding pointed out very at the be very beginning here, this is a complex uh, motor skill that we're trying to train. Yeah. 
And I think those of us that teach singing, that is the art of teaching. That is the art of teaching singing, is taking the individual's needs, the evidence-based voice pedagogy component three, <laughs> take <laughs> a little plug there, huh? <laughs> I didn't plan on that. Um, but that's where we take that into account, you know? And that is the joy of what we do, I think, is that it's not the same lesson every, every hour or even every week with the same student mm -hmm. because their needs are taken into account, so. Lynn H., anything as we wrap up here to add? No, I don't think so. I you guys laid out a really difficult, uh, you know, uh, information really beautifully, and uh, we could keep going, and maybe we'll, ha we'll have you on again in, uh, next year and, and do part two of this because it's so <laughs> interesting and, and get more into some application. But for now, uh, thank you so very much for the generosity of your time. I'm getting lots of thank yous from our audience to you both, so thank you. And Nats attendees, um, please tune in on March 10th for Ian Howell, who will talk about the special psychoacoustics of the singing voice. So we'll look forward to that. And um, my goodness, we're just getting so many thank yous. So thank you all for joining us. We'll see you in March and have a, a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Lynn H.